Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Racial Reckoning, Planned Parenthood's largest affiliate, removes founder Margaret Sanger's name from its building over her eugenics support. We have the latest details and more on how Sanger's legacy lives on in Planned Parenthood today. The Lie That Binds, a top pro-abortion lobbyist, says in her new book, the pro-life movement's political founding is based on racism and misogyny, we speak out, and pro-life feminists. UK author and bioethicist Fiorella Nash says radical feminism betrays women, but we need pro-life feminists today. Planned Parenthood's largest affiliate is removing founder Margaret Sanger's name from its Manhattan facility over what it calls her racist legacy. And what's a surprising admission from the abortion industry? Planned Parenthood of Greater New York is removing founder Margaret Sanger's name from its Manhattan facility because of what it calls her, quote, harmful connections to the eugenics movement. In a statement released last week, a spokesperson for the affiliate called stripping away Singer's name both a necessary and overdue step to reckon with our legacy and acknowledge Planned Parenthood's contributions to historical reproductive harm within communities of color. This is the same New York Planned Parenthood affiliate that in June ousted its CEO after an open letter accused her of unfair treatment towards black staff members, among other abuses. Planned Parenthood has long defended or deflected on its founder's eugenics past. Hear how a video celebrating Planned Parenthood's first 100 years addresses the controversy. Margaret worked with civil rights leaders, immigrant women, and black communities, but also aligned herself with eugenicists. It doesn't seem to make sense. But way back in the early 20th century, eugenics was an immensely popular social movement, one with the kind of widespread legitimacy Margaret craved for her own birth control campaign. It used to be they would simply deny that she was a eugenicist at all. And then the Internet happened, and they couldn't deny that anymore. Dr. Angela Franks is a Catholic theology professor and author of Margaret Sanger's Eugenic Legacy. She tells us Sanger and other eugenicists sought to manipulate the human race through selective breeding. She believed that the world was divided up into the so-called fit and the so-called unfit, and that she wanted to ensure that the unfit were not going to have children. Dr. Franks says Sanger's world's view can be summarized by a slogan the Planned Parenthood founder wrote in her journal. The slogan goes, quality, not quantity. And so for Sanger, eugenics safeguarded that quality side of the equation. Planned Parenthood is not the only organization grappling with Margaret Sanger's legacy. U.S. Representative Russ Fulcher, a Republican from Idaho, has renewed calls to remove Sanger's bust from the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. In a letter to the Secretary of the Smithsonian, the congressman writes, quote, As our nation struggles to address racial injustice, it is unconscionable that an avowed racist and eugenicist is featured so prominently. I Representative Fulcher called Singer a bad apple also, in American history. Uh, she, she flew under the guise of championing women's health, when in reality, her, her uh, motives were significantly different. The Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery has confirmed to EWTN News it moved the bust of Singer from its Struggle for Justice exhibit to elsewhere in the museum. Christina Bennett is the communications director for the Family Institute of Connecticut. She's also co-chair of Pro-Life Voices for Trump. Christina, welcome back. What's your reaction to this news? Planned Parenthood's largest affiliate will remove Margaret Sanger's name from its Manhattan facility. Thank you for having me. My response is that this is not enough by any means. If they really want to reckon with their racist history, they need to stop targeting communities of color. Planned Parenthood of Greater New York is still performing abortions, and they are still primarily performing abortions for women of color. So it's ridiculous for them to think that they can remove themselves from Margaret Sanger's legacy when they are killing black babies every single day at their abortion clinic. It's 
it's evil, it's wicked, and they are living out the mission that Margaret Sanger had, although they say they want to distance themselves from her. Christina, in reviewing Margaret Sanger's work, she wrote and spoke frequently about population control and considered some people, quote, unfit. What's your reaction to Sanger's eugenic ideology? Well, I think it's disgusting. I mean, she was talking about people like me, you know, I was someone that was scheduled to be aborted, but thankfully my mom walked out. But she was targeting people like me, people of color, you know, women of color that she felt were like weeds that should be pulled out of the ground. And not only did she push birth control, but she also supported forced sterilizations for black women. So. I just think that everything that she did from the Negro Project to wanting to put birth control in the water to supporting forced sterilizations for women of color, it was evil. And unfortunately, today, it's still being carried out through Planned Parenthood, whether or not they want to admit it. Christina, this is the same New York affiliate that recently ousted its CEO after an open letter accused her of racial discrimination, among other abuses like financial misuse. What do you think is going on there? I'm not really sure exactly. I think that there are staff members, perhaps, who understand that racism is wrong and they want to do something about it. And so I see that they are, you know, starting the process by firing this woman and even trying to reckon with their history. But again, it's not enough unless they really do the work of completely, completely uh, removing themselves from the mission and vision of Margaret Sanger, which would mean stopping abortion, stop targeting women of color, and stop killing unborn children, because New York has the highest rates for abortion. We're talking about a place where more black babies die every single year than are even being born. Their death rate is higher than their birth rate. So. Perhaps with what's happening across the country, there are staff workers who think, okay, you know, we want to be part of this change. We want to be part of this movement for racial justice. And I understand that, but it takes more than just lip service. It takes more than just doing shallow things or virtue signaling. It takes real work, and that's going to include primarily separating themselves from abortion because abortion is the number one cause of death in the black community and you cannot stand fully for racial justice and at the same time end the lives of black children. It just, it's not possible to do both of those things at the same time. I mean, that's my next question. Does removing Margaret Sanger's name from an abortion facility uh, divorce her vision and legacy from Planned Parenthood's mission right now? Absolutely not. I mean, does it? They can they can kill children in their facilities under any name, and the action is still the same. So whether they want to call themselves Planned Parenthood of Greater New York or you know or Margaret Sanger, whatever they want to name their building, the action is what matters. That lives are being taken every single day. That women are being wounded. That fathers. Are, are being wounded, that you know, botched abortions are taking places, that baby body parts are being sold on the market, that women are being lied to about fetal development. All of these things that take place every day under the banner of Planned Parenthood, they can call it whatever they want, but the action remains the same and it's wrong. It's injustice, it's dehumanization, it's wicked, and it needs to stop. Christina, the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery has moved a bust of Margaret Sanger from its Struggle for Justice exhibit to elsewhere in the museum. Would you like to see the Smithsonian take further action there? I'd like to see it completely removed. There's no point for it to be there. I mean, struggle for justice. Abortion is the greatest human rights injustice of our day and of our time. There should be 
that Margaret Singer has nothing to do with justice. If anything, it was a false justice movement because she unfortunately, through the Negro Project, lied to and manipulated and convinced African American ministers and you know civil rights leaders to stand with her. But that was because she manipulated them. So if we're going to look at her history, then we have to look at all of it and we'll realize that this woman did not stand for justice and there should be no bust of her really in any museum at all. We just have a brief period here, Christina, just to address there are serious conversations about race and racial reconciliation happening in our country. Could this be a moment more people's eyes are open to the reality of Sanger and her work? I hope so. I would say that the one positive from Planned Parenthood of Greater New York changing their name is at least it validates what we've been saying about them for a long time. Pro-lifers have always said that Margaret Sanger was a racist, that she had a Negro project, that she targeted people of color, and Planned Parenthood and their employees and staff, they've always denied that, they've looked the other way, they've downplayed it, and now we can point to what's happening, we can point to the name change and say, see, this is the reality of what's going on. But again, more has to be done because they're going to say, oh, well, a lot of people were eugenicists at the time and she partnered with them. And that's not true. She didn't just partner with them. She was leading the way. So even though we can point to what they're doing right now as evidence, we still need to tell people, don't just believe what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Research it. Read Absolutely. Sanger's own writings. Because I firmly believe if anyone was to read her own writings, they would be disgusted and appalled. Christina Bennett with the Family Institute of Connecticut and Pro-Life Voices for Trump. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. We continue this conversation with Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List and the other co-chair of Pro-Life Voices for Trump. Marjorie, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York has removed Margaret Sanger's name from the building, but you say that is not enough. Can you outline what further action you are calling for? Yeah, a name change is uh, something, something good. The fundamentals are what has to change when it comes to targeting the minorities among the minorities, the babies among minorities. Um, so we want to see uh, this organization publish the historical data that's reflective of the fact that they have uh, targeted minority communities for many, many years. So let's see that, uh, that historic data according to race. Um, they haven't let that information out. We, I can understand why. Now the country should be calling for that data to be released so that we can see their numbers and the consequence of their targeting of that community. Also, they need to stop their fierce opposition to anti-discrimination abortion mm -hmm. laws across the country. They're passing everywhere for all the right reasons. Um, abortion is an abomination, but again, it particularly targets the vulnerable among the vulnerable. Um, children with disabilities, uh, sex selection abortions, and, uh, and ethnicity. Um, all are targets of people who have a lot in common. With, uh, with Margaret Sanger. So stop that opposition, get behind it because of how menacing that, uh, so that uh, opposition has been and how harmful it has been. Um, and then thirdly, uh, it may be a, uh, uh, just a uh, symbolic act, but we think it's very important for Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton to disavow Margaret Sanger and to give back the awards that they have been given by this organization. When Hillary Clinton received hers, she called Margaret Sanger her greatest hero. Well, let's see what she thinks about that now, now that others know more about this great hero of hers. They need to give the awards back. Marjorie, can you speak to how Sanger's works really twisted, how our culture views women and fertility, and how that continues into today? Yeah, you know, it's why Susan B. Anthony List is called the Susan B. Anthony List. Abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. And Margaret Sanger, none other, would, would she target them and demean women by targeting them and their children for extinction. Um, she called uh, Catholic immigrant moms useless breeders. Um, certain segments of the population, like Negroes and those who were called mentally retarded or defective in that time, that they needed to be weeded out. They were human weeds among the beautiful that, uh, and the proud and the beautiful and the chosen. Um, then they needed to be eliminated. Um, anyone considered not up to her par. 
uh, what a powerful place to be. Yeah. Um, this organization is not health care for women. It never has been. Uh, contrast it with the beautiful view and the beautiful um, uh, picture that Mother Teresa uh, provides, loving women, loving their children, calling, um, saying it's crazy to think that you would want fewer children. It's like saying you should have fewer flowers. Mm. Um, such a beautiful view and such a contrast to this woman who um, didn't see women as equal necessarily only for how they produced appropriate progeny. As you mentioned, we've seen pro-abortion politicians embrace Margaret Sanger. How has that happened, and is she still an accepted figure among abortion advocates today? Well, she is. Um, we're in a moment of, co of historic correction, I believe, if the pro-life movement continues its press against the pro-abortion movement clinging to her name. It's not just the clinging to her name, however, it's the clinging to the roots of the abortion movement, which is why it has her name in some of these places. It's clinging to the idea that somehow in this utilitarian, horrible way that we weed out people who won't give us trouble later. Not recognizing that each child is sent for a specific purpose that only he or she can perform. And we have no idea what that plan is for that little boy or that little girl. That's what needs to be rooted out. The idea that somehow we know before they're even born what they will accomplish or won't accomplish in life. That's what has to go. And I hope that yes, Margaret Sanger's name will be set aside and we'll all see her for the woman um, and the mission that she fought for. Absolutely. Marjorie Dannenfelter, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you for your empowering work and words. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. House Democrats are renewing their efforts to repeal the Hyde Amendment. In fact, just last week, Massachusetts Representative Ayanna Presley introduced an amendment to strip the Hyde Amendment from this year's federal spending bill. The Hyde Amendment is attached to spending bills and prohibits public funding of abortions through Medicaid reimbursements. It was first passed in 1976. It's passed every year since and has long enjoyed bipartisan support up until recently, as it's under intense political pressure from pro-abortion politicians. But the Hyde Amendment has saved 2.4 million lives from the tragedy of abortion and needs to be protected. That brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to urge your member of Congress to protect the Hyde Amendment. Once you type in your information, you'll see we drafted letters to your specific members of Congress, to your senators and your representative. You can update the letter to your preference and then send it directly to your lawmakers to tell them to protect Hyde. The Hyde Amendment has saved 2.4 million lives since it was first passed. Let's protect its life-affirming legacy and from abortion extremism in Congress. Take action by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Coming up, we explore how radical feminism betrays women. UK author and bioethicist Fiorella Nash joins us to explain why she thinks the pro-life movement needs to better embrace pro-life feminism. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. The head of a pro-abortion lobby released a new book this month that, instead of untangling lies like it claims, only sows more. That is this week's Speak Out segment. The president of NARAL, Elise Hoag, released a book last week called The Lie That Binds. In it, she claims to historically trace how political conservatives targeted abortion as their rallying cry in the 1970s. Why? Hoag suggests it's because they thought it would evoke support from racists and white supremacists. Here's an excerpt from The Lie That Binds that claims to give a behind the scenes of 1970s conservative strategy. Quote, Weyrich and Falwell were convinced that at a moment when civil rights leaders were making advances and overtly racist appeals were losing their power, they would soft pedal their racism and persuade more Americans to fear the impact of giving freedom and power to women. Since racism and misogyny have always been tangled in American society, finding the right balance that kept just enough women on board was key to success. Hogue here is claiming political conservatives decided to become pro-life because they couldn't be openly racist, but they could be openly sexist. Well, 
Asking a pro-abortion activist to recount pro-life history is just reason number one to not trust this book. The pro-life movement gained support throughout the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and into the new millennium because people can recognize the egregious Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision and the complete inhumanity when it comes to abortion. To claim the pro-life movement is built on racism and misogyny is a twisted lie. The last I checked, it was a Planned Parenthood affiliate that had to strip founder Margaret Sanger from its name because of her blatant eugenic roots. The pro-life movement believes in women, that they have the ability to carry and love their child. The lie that binds here is the lie that abortion empowers women. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, we introduce you to a UK author and bioethics expert who says not only is pro-life feminism possible, it is vital. Fiorella Nash is a bioethicist and author of The Abolition of Woman, How Radical Feminism is Betraying Women. In the book, she outlines how feminism should embrace a pro-life ethic to make a powerful stand for equality for both women and the unborn. And joining us now from our EWTN Great Britain studio in Walsingham, England, is Fiorella Nash herself. Fiorella, thanks for being here. Pro-life feminism is a really interesting and ongoing conversation happening in pro-life circles today. So first off, how do you respond to those who say pro-life feminism is a contradiction in terms? I hear that a lot. And I think, unfortunately, we've become so used to the idea, to the lie that abortion empowers women that a lot of people are just not prepared to question that. But what I say is, Abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. It has always been a tool of exploitation. And pro-life feminism is authentic feminism. Mm. You say pro-life feminism can be a powerful way forward for protecting vulnerable human lives. Why is this approach especially effective? I think it's important to try to peel away those lies that say that to be pro-life is to be a misogynist. I find it a ludicrous notion that opposing abortion is in any way attack on women because in the end, I've said that abortion is exploitative. I feel if more women get behind the pro-life movement and if feminists particularly come behind the pro-life movement, I feel we can really see some really big changes. I'm very mindful of the very good work that a lot of men are doing in the movement. I don't in any way want to suggest there's a problem there, but I do feel that this is a battle that must be fought and won by women. You know in your book it's always been the role of feminism to question the status quo. So why do you think we're not seeing that when it comes to women in the pro-abortion movement? Well, I think there are concerted efforts to stop women from questioning abortion rhetoric within feminist circles. Certainly women I know, and I have had this experience myself, who do question abortion tend to be vilified, bullied, pushed out of the movement very, very quickly. And it's a recurring problem. So I think that is a very major difficulty. But really, my book isn't just a way of um, challenging mainstream feminism. I'm also asking mainstream feminists, radical feminists, to come together and to open up this conversation because I think this is something we should be talking about in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. There's this common claim that if abortion becomes illegal, women will be driven to back alley abortions. Mm -hmm. But you say that's unwitting misogyny. Can you explain how? Well, my feeling is, first of all, a lot of those arguments about backstreet abortion or back alley abortion are based on false statistics. Bernard Nathanson admits that they simply made up the numbers. Similar admissions have been made in Britain and other European countries. So that whole argument is based upon a lie, certainly a fabrication of the evidence. But first and foremost, it's a council of despair. It's saying women with the right resources, with the right support, can't possibly be expected to find positive solutions mm. to an unexpected pregnancy. And what I'm saying is 
we should, instead of being so negative about women, we should be ensuring that women have the support and education they need to carry a baby to term, to explore the options, for example, adoption in some cases, but that ending a human life is never a solution, and it need not be a solution. There are always positive alternatives if women are given the opportunity. In your opinion, what are practical ways the pro-life movement can better embrace pro-life feminism? Well, I think there needs to be certainly more understanding of the female experience, more understanding of the situations in which women do find themselves in unexpected or problem pregnancies. I think there's a lot of help already there within the pro-life movement. I'm very impressed, for example, by the number of crisis pregnancy centres you have in the US. I think that's a very, very positive step. But I think we need to go a lot further with that. And I think we need to encourage pro-life women to be a lot more proactive. I think many women are intimidated by the constant message that you're not a real feminist if you support the pro-life movement, you're not a real woman. But we have to be prepared to stand up and say, no, you don't promote abortion in my name and really need to get ourselves out there. I was really delighted to see a pro-life feminist group at the Women's March some years ago. They were banned from coming, but they went anyway and they stood at the front of the procession with their banners. That's the sort of proactive pro-life feminism we need. That's the kind of empowering message we need to give to women today. Thank you for your empowering message. Fiorella Nash, author of The Abolition of Women, How Radical Feminism is Betraying Women. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. If you want to email instead, you can always send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.